Today's guest uh, is Dr. Joshua Lee, uh, who is a chief clinical advisor who specializes in medication-assisted treatment of alcohol and opioid use disorders. And Dr. Lee conducts clinical trials and treats patients struggling with addiction as a primary care physician, uh, as a professor at NYU at the Grossman School of Medicine. He leads the Addiction Medicine Fellowship, a fellowship and conducts research focused on justice and community outcomes. And today we're going to be exploring addiction treatment. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, naltrexone uh, and if he encourages the use of that or under what circumstances he would encourage that. And we're just going to have a great conversation about evidence-based treatment. Dr. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Would you just tell our listener a little bit about what you do and who you do that for as it relates specifically to alcohol use disorders? Yep. Uh, I trained as a primary care doctor in internal medicine as opposed to like family medicine. Uh, and uh, so I'm a GP. And then I later would specialize before it was an actual board certified specialty in addiction medicine. And now we have a fellowship in addiction medicine. It's one of the newest specialties in American board certified specialty care. Um, and that is alongside addiction psychiatry, which has existed for longer uh, in the States. And so those are now kind of like two addiction specialty credentials you can get as a GP, as a psychiatrist, as an emergency room physician, as a pediatrician. Um, so that's been one focus is doing more kind of in general medicine and from a primary care perspective for addiction in primary care settings. A lot of addiction treatment obviously is, um, you know, we think of rehab and 28 day inpatient and maybe long term or other kind of residential care. And then a lot of fairly intensive outpatient work. And then, of course, like 12 step uh, peer support, more anonymous, confidential community based resources. Um, not so much, hey, I just go see my doctor you know, at the neighborhood health clinic, and that's where I'm getting treatment for alcohol or smoking cessation or opiate use disorder. Um, so over my career, we've been trying to, you know, really kind of blend in evidence-based principles of uh, addiction and substance use treatment, prevention, um, and, uh, and kind of medical and, and behavioral problems related to those disorders in primary care. Um, and that, of course, is dovetailed with the opiate epidemic in the United States. So my career, kind of graduated med school in 1999. So my whole kind of career over the last 20 plus years has been uh, largely thinking about reducing overdoses and dealing with the worsening and worsening overdose epidemic. And then in primary care, that became uh, more and more uh, practical because we had medications like um, extended release naltrexone, uh, but first and foremost, uh, buprenorphine products. That's Suboxone, Sublocade, other branded products that are now largely generic in terms of the daily oral uh, stuff. And so a, a lot of my career has been, has been that, kind of responding to opiate use disorders, principally um, heroin and now fentanyl problems with outpatient medications like buprenorphine. And then with alcohol, it's a lot of the same. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm in primary care. I can see you every couple of weeks, or maybe you're stable and we can check in every few months, but there's a medication that can help you, or that medication was okay, but you had a side effect or you want to switch and let's try the second medication, or we can do these two kind of in combination. I also hope you explore AA or 12 step or individual therapy or any kind of other specialty help you want to get for an alcohol use disorder and try and prescribe more medications than we do currently for a common treatable disorder. And so the larger thesis is, hey, we can do a lot for addiction. You probably didn't know. And it can be kind of simple, fairly effective and pretty accessible through something like a primary care visit. Uh, and um, we, we can apply that to both alcohol, tobacco and uh, opiate use disorders. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So as it relates to alcohol, I'd love to have the focus on alcohol specifically for this conversation. Yeah. If someone presents themselves into your office as a, you know, a general practitioner, mm -hmm. you know, someone and they say, I'm really struggling with alcohol. At what point do you say, okay, I'm going to prescribe you some medication versus mm -hmm. say, encouraging them to go to some peer uh, support groups such as AA or elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Like at what point mm -hmm. do you say, okay, 
I'm going to prescribe medication here versus, okay, I'm not going to prescribe medication here. Yeah, I want to add, bring it into the conversation right away, along with all those other resources and kind of present like a, a menu um, of, you know, treatments. So we have this, we have that, we have this, we have that. And depending on the person and their preferences, just explore what they're motivated, capable, uh, what's accessible to them, uh, what they have time for. Uh, often people have you know, often it's not the first time they're having that that talk and they've they've done this or that and they have pretty strong opinions as far as what they want to do next. So I try and work with that. You know, we don't just blanketly say, you, medical problem, now, medicine, take, you know, come back. No, no argument, no discussion. Like we I can't tell patients what to do. So I I want to have a conversation and kind of develop a plan that is centered on their needs and strengths and, and their motivation. Um, and, but I do want to offer medications early on. Um, if not the first time we ever have that conversation, when we're really talking about making lasting behavior change and strategies that can be effective early, middle, late, kind of in the recovery process, I definitely want to address the use of medications. And some people that's going to click, you know, some people are, they have not heard of it or they've heard a little bit and they're curious, um, you know, it, it's not going to be for everyone, but there are plenty of patients that are like, oh, great, there's there's a pill I can take for this medical problem. Um, they're used to that, especially if they're already, you know, customers like I, I know you, you're my patient or you came to my hospital or called me on the phone for a televisit kind of expecting you know, doctor type care. Um, and, uh, and I am, you know, very much situated in kind of like mainstream health center or through a company or that I work with kind of an online um, prescription application. So what, what I'm, you know, heavily kind of situated and invested in is like what people would expect from me is like, I ordered a bunch of tests and prescribed a bunch of medications, you know, like pretty standard, you know, doctor stuff. So in that sense, it's not, that shocking or surprising or unexpected for patients if we are talking about medications for alcohol, even if they didn't know about it before. Naltrexone seems mm -hmm. to be the most known yeah. prescription drug for what exactly? Could you just tell our listener from maybe yeah. who's unfamiliar with that drug and that medication, yep. what does it do and who's it for? Yeah, now Trexone was developed kind of in the 60s and 70s, and then finally kind of in, in retail medicine by the 80s for alcohol use disorder and opiate use disorder. And why would it work for both those problems? Now, Trexone is very much like an opiate. Um, and in fact, the, the lore is they were looking for a kind of non-addicting opiate that would help with pain treatment. And they found this molecule now Trexone. It turns out it, it fits really tightly. And, um, and for some length of time at the opiate receptor in our brain, in particular, the mu opiate receptor. And that is where a lot of activity is for opiates. So like codeine, morphine, heroin, they all work at the uh, mu opiate receptor, which has a lot of kind of concentration in our mid brain and frontal cortex, where we kind of experience pleasure and then start to learn to kind of repeat that behavior. So it very much is kind of right in the pathway of what becomes for many people an opiate problem where they need to keep kind of doing opiates to keep getting pleasure. And then because they get physically dependent on opiates and will get sick if they don't have them. What now Trexone can do is totally block that receptor in the sense that this is a molecule that goes into our brain to that other molecule, which is the opiate receptor kind of fits in there. But then it's an antagonist. It doesn't do anything. It itself is not an opiate. It's not a controlled substance. You cannot get high, euphoric, sedated, uh, constipated on naltrexone as opposed to other opiates. So it's what we call in pharmacology an antagonist. It's going to a place where other medicines and, and, uh, and stuff works, but it's doing the kind of opposite or blocking the effects that are normally seen with, with agonist or kind of proactive agents at that same receptor. Now, why would that help with alcohol? I just told you a whole story about opiates. Um, it turns out some of us drink for opiate-like pleasures. Uh, alcohol has some opiate-like effects. It can help us kind of with feeling no pain uh, if I'm in pain, feeling less anxious if I'm already kind of a little nervous, anxious, or irritable. Um, the whole kind of 
I get euphoric and buzzed and, and kind of happy. The stuff I like about drinking, especially early on in a drinking episode, um, all that can be mediated by the opiate system, not necessarily for all of us, but for a lot of us. And so if you block the, uh, the kind of alcohol stimulating your opiate system, um, you can still drink and get inebriated and intoxicated and a lot of other effects that alcohol has on the brain, kind of all over the brain. But if you're stopping the opiate-like effects, it may not be as fun, it may not be as tasty, it may not be as rewarding in the kind of subconscious and kind of uh, uh, conscious level. You may not think about it as much in terms of cutting down on cravings when you are kind of early in recovery and, and just trying not to drink, but it's five o'clock. I just finished the softball game with my buddies. I always have beers, you know, this, this time of day, this day of the week. And it just helps you kind of not listen to that or not have that kind of message pop up on your internal, you know, kind of like dashboard. So now Trexone for alcohol for some patients, not all, it's not guaranteed. You have to kind of try it to see if it might have these effects on you can really kind of have people give uh, statements like, I just don't think about it as much, or I don't really look forward to it as much. I don't like the taste of alcohol like I used to. Um, and then net net, you're hoping to get somebody on naltrexone on a daily basis, once a day, sometimes in a twice a day dosing, but usually once a day at the right dose. And they just drink less. They come back and tell you a month later, they have more days where they didn't drink where they were able to quit once and for all for good, they haven't drank at all, or I'm still drinking. I'm not, I'm kind of ambivalent if I'm going to stop drinking altogether, but I, I have more control over it. Um, and I'm not doing as much heavy drinking. So after the softball game with my buddies, I had one beer and then uh, I had to go and then I had a soda and that was it, you know, and instead of like sitting there and having the seven beers you used to, on naltrexone, I might not want to use as much, or I just am able to prioritize not using and, and different healthier choices. So, and it can complement any other behavior change or work people are doing with therapy, with AA, with groups, with online smart recovery, whatever other kind of resources, they don't really conflict with being on naltrexone. The only contraindication in naltrexone is being on opiates because it's an opiate blocker. So if you are on chronic pain opiates or I'm already in treatment for an opiate use disorder. I'm on methadone or suboxone, and I have a drinking problem and want to get treated for that now. Uh, you now trexone will not fit. But for most people who don't have an opiate use disorder, are not on opiates, are not physically dependent on opiates, they can start now trexone right away. There's a couple other conversations we want to have around side effects. Um, if people have severe liver disease, we monitor that more closely than people without any history of alcohol related liver disease. Um, but for most people, it's going to be safe and pretty accessible to try for a couple of weeks, try it for a couple of months. And, and again, there's no guarantees. It probably works in uh, more people than it doesn't work. It does beat placebo in trials when you do um, more kind of rigorously designed randomized control trials. We think the number needed to treat is fairly low and acceptable, meaning the number I have to write a prescription to so that I get one person kind of giving me a total success story. That number is around five to 10, which is similar to other stuff we do in primary care in terms of prevention and treatment of other chronic disorders. But I do have to treat five to 10 people to get that one person who's like miracle cure, that worked doc, that was awesome. And that's a little bit better of a rate than I get with placebo or a sugar pill, but it's not like it works in everybody or that everybody wants to take it for a long-term kind of process that, that of course, can have a lot of ups and downs. Uh, and then the, the goal is then to kind of just use it to connect with the patient and have something you're both working on. And then, of course, our other perspective is come back and see me over the rest of your life. Like, let's keep working on what can be a chronic problem that can kind of come and go. And some days you're doing well with it, some days you're not. So kind of keeping people grounded and realistic about how hard it can be. And then also like how you need to kind of keep watering the plant, you know, over the weeks and months. And it doesn't just happen all of a sudden and you're done and you never have to think about it again. May I ask uh, for you to elaborate on potential side effects for someone mm -hmm. who maybe doesn't have a liver disease yeah. or any kind of pre-existing challenges someone yep. 
knows they drink too much. They've been trying to stop for a considerable time. They're unable. It's causing marital stress. It's, yep. their, their blood pressure is increasing. They're not sleeping great. Right? These are all behavioral things. But let's just say someone who's not maybe, I would submit, chemically addicted to mm-hmm. alcohol. Maybe they sh- they've just got behavioral challenges and they're, they're, they're finding it challenging. Yeah. And they don't have pre-existing health conditions. What are the side effects of taking naltrexone? Uh, yeah, I like that case, too, because most people with the drinking problem can stop on their own. So they don't have like the physical dependence where they're going to go into a moderate to severe alcohol withdrawal syndrome. And that's that's something that we often forget is that most people, even if you're drinking a lot per day, you can stop and you don't need to like check yourself into a clinic uh, to start that process. Uh, and then say you and I don't have other medical problems, but we're dealing with heavy alcohol use and we want to try naltrexone. The most likely thing we would find is... Um, uh, if we took a full dose right away, some tummy trouble, uh, kind of like new antibiotics can upset your stomach. That's very common, especially if you start right away on a full dose of naltrexone. Um, usually it does not produce actual vomiting, uh, but you can just feel kind of queasy, fluey, uh, nauseous and loss of appetite. Uh, and then uh, we, we try and abate that by just starting at a slower, lower dose. And over the course of one week, say, going from like a, a quarter of a pill to a full 50 milligram dose. Um, and then uh, other, this, this kind of fluey, icky feeling uh, it is more common when people start naltrexone than versus like placebo. And that can uh, also be experienced as kind of headachey um, and then overall kind of a flu-like um, feeling uh, over the course of a day or two when you start the medication. Again, we try and um, minimize and prevent that by having people start on a, on a lower than average dose and then ramp up over about a week just to make sure they're not having those problems. Uh, And that's what the oral form. And then it's important to note, there's also a once a month injectable form that you would have to get from a brick and mortar doctor nurse visit. Um, That is a brand name Vivitrol. But there you get a a large dose of naltrexone in an injection. And then it's probably more likely you have the kind of initial fluey, headachey feeling for a day or two. Uh, We know from that medication, which stays in your body for an entire like four to five weeks, and there's no going back once you have the injection, uh, people largely get over these same sensations and side effects within a couple days. So by week two, uh, if I've started people on the injectable or the oral form, they generally are not having as many or or many severe side effects. Um, that's that's the basics. It, it, it's really not worse than that. It doesn't give you allergic reactions. It tends tends not to cause like drug rashes. Um, uh, doesn't interact with uh, other allergic uh, processes like asthma, dermatitis, um, psoriasis. It doesn't give you dementia, uh, heart disease, doesn't increase or decrease your blood pressure, and doesn't really impact your cognition, your uh, energy, your mood. Um, It's really not really psychoactive. Some people do wonder, though, because it's suppressing kind of the the opiate system, and we do have naturally endorphins, and we kind of have an opiate system because it helps us kind of regulate our day-to-day and help us kind of process uh, environmental kind of experiences and, and what we like and what we don't like. Some of that is kind of based on our natural inborn uh, opiate system. It turns out, though, if I block that pharmacologically with naltrexone, you're not suddenly depressed. You don't suddenly hate food. Uh, you don't suddenly not want to play tennis with your your friend who you like to play tennis with every week. So you can still kind of enjoy sleep, sex, socializing, Uh, a poker game, blah, 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 whatever you kind of like to do that is not really kind of like craving and more kind of compulsive, obsessive behavior, like drinking all the time or overeating. And it's also been studied for gambling disorders, methamphetamine disorders that might help people smoke a little bit less, although it's not uh, labeled as a smoking cessation treatment. Um, Now, Trexone seems to kind of suppress this kind of compulsive, but not so good for me behaviors, including drinking. Um, and, uh, and that, but we don't see the reverse side effect where it just like makes me kind of unable to experience pleasure or enjoy everyday life. I would submit 50% of our listeners right now are probably going or thinking, yes, there's a pill that I can take that will make me ambivalent to alcohol. I've been really struggling 
with alcohol and awesome. Mm -hmm. I can go in and I can get a prescription. I can take a pill and I'm good as gold. And then I would suggest there's probably the other half of the listeners who are like, oh my God, here we go again. Another doctor prescribing a pill for sure. goodness sake. Can we please get away from this whole, like just writing a script, take this pill, you'll be fine and move into some holistic approaches. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to invite you to maybe make a case for both of those sides. Like what would be mm -hmm. the case that you would make for, no, not, naltrexone is, is fine and is good. Here's why it's beneficial. And then maybe just mm -hmm. if you can make a case just as, a, as an example of why you would not do that and why you would encourage someone not to take that drug and then actually yeah. take what, I, what I'm describing as a holistic approach. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally acknowledge that you you may have your own experiences with modern healthcare, with pharmaceutical products, with the whole like just finding a doctor you like first, you don't feel kind of listens or respects you, and then um, and then dealing with medications and pharmacies and side effects. Like, there's um, no end to reasons that we'd all like to avoid that, and nobody wants to be on kind of a medication if they don't have to as a kind of general principle and for a kind of as, as little time as possible as a general principle. And yet most of us at some point in our life are going to consider, you know, pharmaceutical treatment for some common condition. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're strictly kind of anti any type of prescription, um, this probably, you wouldn't see this much different than any other kind of like antidepressants for depression. Uh, or um, would you take uh, Zyrtec for your hay fever? Or do you want to look for kind of non-pharmacologic approaches to managing your sniffles? Um, you know, it, some of us are fine with Zyrtec and some of us don't want to put that in our bodies and would look for other stuff. So depending on how you land on that, um, that then I have more of a discussion. But uh, I think for people that are like, oh, great, there's a pill. For some people, that really is a powerful and... Um, may be enough. Uh, we certainly see that in like opiate use disorder treatment and sometimes in smoking cessation where I've tried, I've tried, I've tried kind of stuff that hasn't worked for me. I'm still smoking and then getting a prescription on something like Chantix really made a big difference. Or in the case of opiate use disorder, being on Suboxone or Methadone has finally helped me not continue using heroin where I was really having a, an astounding problem just trying to detox and then stay kind of sober with alcohol. Um, it, you could probably have similar kind of experiences where I've tried this, I've tried that. So I, I think it would be like, if you've been doing stuff that hasn't worked to your satisfaction, you haven't tried medication, it's an option. And that might be a good one for you. And you really just have to see how it goes. So I'm not kind of like getting people out of the work that it takes to make change because alcohol is still going to be all around you. You're still going to have to make kind of conscious choices to do different stuff and not use it versus use it. Uh, but the medication can just make those easier decisions and make it less of a kind of internal struggle. I personally don't see anything wrong with that if the medication is otherwise affordable, accessible, and, you know, has an acceptable side effect profile in terms of safety. But for the person that really wants to go more holistic, um, I, I would say that's great too. And this is not going to be a guaranteed uh, success story. And it's not, um, it's not necessarily uh, something you have to start with. Um, so kind of like to, to bring everyone to the same like pamphlet, like if you're ever interested in it, it's, it's something to try. And then if you just want to go, well, okay, you're the, you're the alcohol czar of the country and uh, we have a crisis and you have to get as many people to stop drinking in the next year as possible. If you had to really kind of rank order what interventions are going to work for an entire population, uh, medication and naltrexone ranks pretty high. You can debate like what the top approach is versus the second, but in terms of like the top three or four things to do or to offer to everyone, there's no question from kind of years of data and I think like the best designed uh, studies that uh, naltrexone in a pretty simple medical management format, like you could get from a general practitioner, what you can get online, uh, what you could get from, uh, a, you know, a, a basic wellness kind of visit, plus addressing your alcohol 
that works pretty well versus more intensive stuff that's like classic licensed alcohol treatment where you're going to go to a program, you're going to go a lot, you're going to have a lot of therapy groups and kind of like visits per week um, in terms of uh, 12 step encouragement. How does it compare to just doing AA versus just doing medications? We think both of those are pretty good approaches, but the medications might be a little bit more effective kind of head to head. So then you can get into like how to build a national guideline and what should we recommend to everybody just based on the evidence we have. Um, there you can say naltrexone and, and medication treatments actually stack up quite well. And they are kind of at the top of most of the guidelines you'll see. I want to share the story of a, a former client of ours who came to us uh, a couple of years ago and he was drinking excessively and he came to our coaching program, which is called Project 90, and we help people to stop drinking for at least 90 days. We do it without medication mm -hmm. or rather we don't encourage medication. We just do it as a holistic way and, and we do it as a rewiring of the mindset. Mm -hmm. And this particular client came to us and he was on four different types of medications, acid reflux medication, blood pressure medication, sleep medication, and antidepressants. And mm -hmm. he had been on those for what he said up to 10 years. So some of them he'd been on for a decade, some of them maybe a few years, et cetera. But certainly when he came to us, he was on four different medications. He then stopped drinking through our, let's call it mind rewiring process. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of, I think it was six or seven months, if I recall correctly, he, com he got off all medication completely and is now mm -hmm. a couple of years later, uh, sharing with any with everyone and anyone that he feels amazing. He's lost weight. He hasn't been on any medication for you know since he got off it. His life feels uh, is so much more joy. He's mm -hmm. sleeping well. He's not depressed anymore. He has very low stress and anxiety. Where once he had high stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what could you, can you attribute? just stopping alcohol to him getting off those four medications. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. First of all, I just want yeah, to ask you, what's, I, what's your I, thoughts on that? I, it sounds great. I, that could be really motivating to people that um, are finding it hard to focus on this like absolute recovery goal and, and focus more on alcohol, of course, can excessive alcohol use is linked to higher risk of higher blood pressure. Uh, uh, acid reflux, uh, poor sleep and, and mood symptoms like depression, anxiety. So it could be all those were people treating symptoms of alcohol, but not really addressing the alcohol. So it, it's absolutely, it's probably quite common that people mm. that are heavy drinkers on a daily or regular basis have side effects. They have kind of medical conditions related to that heavy alcohol use. And then that's what your average doctor does. And, and I want to also fully yes. acknowledge that the physician and medical workforce often ignores, misses, is incapable of, doesn't have time for, whatever it is, they don't recognize or adequately treat a, a primary alcohol use disorder. And, and that is very common in primary care. So while I'm saying, oh, we can do all this stuff in primary care, we can also just completely miss the main headline which is that Mr. B has, you know, a, a pretty serious alcohol problem and not much else is going to get a lot better without addressing that alcohol problem. So then the person through whatever means, but it sounds like not using medication and using, you know, this kind of behavioral approach, um, the, uh, the holistic package is able to make changes, which is awesome. And then they don't need, they, they start to lose some of those medical problems associated with the daily drinking. They feel a lot better. Their weight's going down. Their blood pressure's improving. They don't have the reflux and they can sleep a lot better. They feel better energy and mood wise, concentration, diet, sexual function, all that stuff. Uh, that's like a huge win. Now, you could have used naltrexone in there to help you with that, but that person didn't. And, and they did great with the recovery plan that worked for them. So th that does not surprise me in that we more and more, we recognize all these medical problems that link back to alcohol. Uh, there was a lot of press this week about uh, kind of yet another uh, kind of article study and report pointing towards um, elevated cancer risk, especially in middle, uh, younger and middle-aged adults 
uh, linked to heavy drinking. So the kind of understanding that um, heavy alcohol use has profound kind of pro-cancer uh, properties, and that's been under-recognized until like kind of the last like five to 10 years. And probably no amount of alcohol is like healthy in the way that people have also kind of grown up hearing about like red wine or the Mediterranean diet. Uh, we probably think that some alcohol is maybe neutral, like it's not going to necessarily kill you or shorten your lifespan, but don't call it healthy. Um, so I, I like that case, that story, and that it shows a lot of stuff that can be linked to alcohol. And if the alcohol is addressed, uh, the overall kind of health status can improve mm. considerably uh, and get you I, off a lot of medications. Yeah, I mean, when you were putting forward the, the idea that if he had used now Trexone, he would then he would have been on five different medications, right? He'd been on the he'd be on the acid reflux, the blood pressure, the sleep medication, the antidepressants, and now he comes and he says, "Oh, and I'm drinking a lot." That would mean that a primary care giver, like a GP or a doctor, would then put him on naltrexone. Now he's yeah. on five five medications. That's a is the way the way I see it, where I'm hearing it. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a big problem. And by your own, and again, I don't want this to come across as I'm criticizing you just because you're a doctor, right? It's easy to just throw all doctors under the bus. But yeah, yeah, a couple of things you said. Uh, felt alarming to me because you, you actually said in primary care most doctors ignore miss or don't have time for to primarily treat aud or identify that an alcohol use disorder is the problem because someone's coming saying i've got acid reflux i've got high blood pressure i've got sleep problems i'm depressed why i guess my question is why the heck aren't primary doctors asking about their alcohol use and just saying stop stop and, and instead yeah. saying stop drinking alcohol and i don't have to prescribe you four different medications yeah. Why, yeah so, why is that not happening? Uh, it probably a legacy of many decades of kind of ignoring it, not not um, not really accepting that we should be screening for it uh, in the ways that we know we should be. Um, and just kind of a lack of uh, training. Uh, we are trying to fix that. The good news is, you know, the, the doctor that graduated med school this year is much more likely to have been trained to think about alcohol smoking opiate other other substance use disorders um and uh and then to do something about it uh, and to do something about it themselves rather just refer out to treatment so it could be hit or miss but i'm saying like that's that's not an unusual story where i've been seeing my doctor he keeps like if i go in and say oh you know doc i'm anxious but i don't like come in and say i need your help you know not drinking as much um, the doctor will say, oh, anxiety, uh, here's some Lexapro. Uh, and that'll be the extent of, you know, kind of the investigation. And, uh, and that doctor won't put it all together. So I'm not, um, I don't know who that person was seeing uh, for their medical team, but chances are uh, collectively uh, they were missing it. Or the patient never felt comfortable disclosing or really kind of being real because they felt they'd be judged, they were ashamed, they were guilty, uh, or they just were never asked. Those are all like possible combinations of where this goes south and why alcohol use disorders are undertreated. And net net, while I say it's all getting better, like we don't use enough of any type of effective alcohol treatment, be it behavioral, self-help or um, medications, because we just don't recognize and kind of intervene on enough uh, alcohol use disorder cases. Um, but I, I can take it as a doctor. I was saying with naltrexone, you might say, well, we need the, to start an alcohol treatment episode. I think a lot of your problems stem from this alcohol. We've got to get that under control. Like, I don't see any of these other things getting much better. Um, and you're probably just going to feel, you know, down and depressed um, and anxious and unable to sleep if, if you're drinking this much. Now, Trexone can help with that. And then, and then over the course of the same period of time, you might find you can keep naltrexone going and start to take away some of those other medications. I think uh, doctors also recognize more and more that polypharmacy is not great. Like the more meds you add on to the person's um, list, the fewer they take as prescribed, because none of us can really keep up with like proper adherence. Um, the more side effects you get, the more drug-drug interactions you get, and the less sense you can make of anything over time. Um, and especially as people get older, they're more likely to have seven medications for this, for that, and blah, blah, blah. And we know that, like, 
that is also a problem. So polypharmacy as we age and for multiple chronic problems um, is not good either. I totally agree with you. So beware of doctors over the age of 40 who are set in their ways and haven't yes. been getting the most recent education, Dr. Lee. Is that kind of what you're saying? Is that the bumper sticker? Beware of doctors over the age of 40. Uh, I think um, it's, there was probably, there's probably some truth to that. Yeah. I'm not saying don't go to your doctor who happens to be 50. That's how old I am. So, But um, look how great a doctor I am. So you can be at least as old as me, but no older. Uh, no, it's something like that. But, you know, it, it has evolved. Our, our kind of understanding is addiction as something we can do something about in most general care settings, be it a mental health clinic, a private psychiatrist, an emergency room, me in primary care. Um, we now see that as a place to, to do a lot for these common uh, substance use problems, including alcohol. But that is still a fairly recent paradigm. Uh, and that um, that was not kind of how I grew up being taught in med school. And I kind of learned it early in practice. Are you now open to those new ideas that are coming? I mean, obviously you are because you're talking about it and you're, you're verbalizing that. But is that now the norm? Like if someone's going through med school, mm -hmm. are they now open to the, to the more holistic approaches? Are they now understanding alcohol use disorder and how that could down the line prevent a patient from having to take acid reflux yeah. medication, blood pressure medication, sleep medication, mm -hmm. antidepressants? So... And, and so what is happening? Like what is happening in the training of our young doctors now? Yeah, there's there's probably more um, exposure to complementary alternative medicines and uh, nutritional uh, exercise, meditation, mindfulness, other types of wellness. Um, maybe it dovetails in, in some in some places with uh, uh, hallucinogens, uh, which are a very kind of like hot area in psychiatry for different disorders. Um, but kind of leaving the standard Western biomedical model and accepting that there's a lot of other stuff that people do throughout the world, throughout history, uh, and that are not just uh, kind of doctor, pharmacy, um, and kind of treatment plan. Um, I, I would not say medical schools in the United States are great at teaching complementary and alternative medicine and making every physician graduate, you know, a, a competent practitioner. Um, but there is kind of recognition more and more that complementary approaches can be helpful and may be just as effective for common problems like sleep disorders, uh, at sometimes weight loss, uh, back pain, and other kind of musculoskeletal and pain syndrome. So there's all sorts of, I think, kind of approaches we should be open to. And I think more and more medical schools are able to acknowledge that people can get help from a lot of different providers and sources and treatment paradigms. Um, I think that we get a little testy if it's like, okay, but you have something I know I have a good treatment for, and you're kind of refusing it because you have some opposition to medical Western medicine in general, um, that maybe you get less sympathy from the medical school dean. Like, you know, if you have colon cancer, there's a pretty like standard approach to it. And if you want to do alternative medicine for something that, you know, we know could be curative, uh, then I think doctors still kind of resent alternative approaches uh, in some of those scenarios. But I think in general, I don't know, the way I was trained, not so much in my medical school, but then in my residency and in my kind of career where I'm now at NYU, I was pretty open to a lot of different approaches to behavioral problems, to uh, chronic medical problems, uh, especially to like pain uh, and um, uh, kind of uh, psychosomatic uh, issues where we just don't have great treatments. That's the other thing. Like if I had an easy curative thing, then I'd tell you about it. But in a lot of cases, people are spending a lot of time with physicians, but the physician doesn't have like a great answer um, to some of these chronic complaints. And there you really have to be open to exploring alternative approaches. Mm. Just a couple of final questions, Dr. Lee, and thanks so much for, for mm -hmm. spending time with us here. Uh, one of the anti-drinking supplements I've seen on the market is niacin, and you can buy that on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Are you aware, or could you just explain to our listener the pros and cons of taking niacin as a stop drinking supplement? 
Yeah, I'm not that familiar with its effects, if any, on drinking. Niacin itself is like a B vitamin. Um, it can it can cause some kind of like flushing. If you take it as a supplement, it's kind of famous for for some like side effects, and a flushing reaction is one. Um, and uh, but it is uh, you you know it is um, part of like fortified grains. Like when my kid eats bread at school, they're probably getting some extra niacin because uh, it's been seen as kind of a heart healthy B vitamin. Um, I, I really don't know about what you're bringing up here, though, the, the effects on drinking, using it as a supplement. Um, I'm all ears, but I don't know any mm. like studies or analysis. Yeah, it causes you to flush like, you know, that uh -huh. flushing feeling, like you said. And the idea is that you take niacin and again, you're ambivalent to drinking. You, you don't Interesting. Want to, you don't want to drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, final question I wanted to ask you. I'm not sure I can articulate it succinctly, but I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. So you, you said you're 50, is that right? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, wonderful. I'm 49, so you're 50. All right. So as time has gone on and you've been practicing medicine and now you're, you, you seemingly are very much open-minded to holistic ways as well as traditional ways, Western, Eastern, et cetera, has your view on medicine and has your view on, say, big pharma, um, changed over the years? Has it changed? Are you more like very strict, like, yeah, traditional Western, Western medicine is the way to go? Or are you less positive about that now and more open to holistic or Eastern medicine? Like how, how is yeah. your mindset around? Let me, yeah. let me give you a little bit more context before I give you an opportunity to answer. I know this is a long-winded question, but there is certainly a feeling amongst many of my friends who are very holistic-based that the American healthcare system in particular just wants us sick enough because there's so much money in it and it keeps the system going. They want us to pop a pill. And doctors are influenced by big pharma trying to get them to write a, to give a pill to a patient when they walk in. And they're not spending the time digging in going, oh, this person has an alcohol use disorder, let's have them stop drinking. Instead, they wanting to just write a script because it's good for business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's certainly the feeling amongst a lot of my friends and colleagues who are very health conscious. Um, I'm not saying they're right. Or I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying my view is right or wrong. I'm just saying that tends to be the view of those who I spend time with. What is your view having spent, mm -hmm. I'm assuming, 30 years in the medical practice? Are those yeah. views warranted? Are they not? Just, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's some truth to all that. Um, and yet you still have medications that you're, you're better off taking than not just like, because they, you know, I, I believe in science. Uh, let me say that. And, um, you know, I believe the COVID vaccine works. I believe like the polio vaccine works. And I think there's uh, justification that's objective and not conflicted and not based on commercial interests in vaccinating everybody for this, that, and the other. And that's an area that's, you know, been heavily challenged um, over the last couple of decades, um, childhood vaccines right up to who should get a COVID vaccine. But, you know, if you want polio, don't take the polio vaccine. Um, you know, and we we're seeing outbreaks in parts of the country um, world rather where where polio vaccine uh, efforts have broken down. Uh, there's just like, you know, science has led to advancements and, and deeper understanding, and that includes medical science. And part of that is then inventing medical cures uh, that, um, that, that can really work and prolong uh, people's life expectancy and increase their quality of life. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a long, healthy life without modern Western medicine. And, and certainly you can talk about whether we should be spending all this time and effort on intensive end of life care or prescribing nine different medicines to everybody above the age of 65 versus working on uh, healthier communities, better food chain in terms of healthy food, um, more opportunities for exercise, less dependence on screens and kind of sedentary entertainment hours. Um, uh, all, all that is like, you know, kind of the modern capitalist country is not necessarily a healthy country. And, um, and that, and the medical establishment is kind of like part of that, but it's not the overall whole problem. Um, 
So something like that. Uh, I, I don't get paid more as a primary care doctor to write five prescriptions versus two prescriptions. There are certainly instances where doctors are directly incentivized to write more prescriptions uh, by a particular pharmaceutical company. Um, that, for the most part, those relationships are forbidden or are, are kind of stamped out pretty vigorously at the kind of place that I practice. But I would also acknowledge that there are there are kind of perverse incentives all over medicine and people do what they get paid to do. I'm paid to see patients, so I'm gonna see a lot of patients, um, but I'm not gonna see more than I can handle. Uh, and I'm gonna see enough so that I can keep my job. Um, surgeons generally are paid to do surgeries, um, you know, so you kind of get what you pay for throughout medicine. Um, but it, I, I think it's generally rare that people are incentivized to like prescribe more drugs just to get people on more drugs or to, to keep them kind of sick. <laughs> like, I, I don't think anyone is, is consciously offering treatments um, with this kind of nefarious, sinister motivation to keep people unwell or to not to not help them. Uh, generally, the people I practice with are trying to help their patients. Uh, and then. And then let, let, let's look at the data. You know, there's there's many conditions where we don't have great treatments, um, but there's a lot of conditions where we do. And those came straight out of the science factory and they're offered to you by, uh, you know, people you don't really like, but they're wearing a white coat and they're called doctors. So, again, like the colon cancer, uh, you know, we have very kind of well worked out kind of hierarchies of evidence about what works for a lot of different problems. And you can avoid that if you have that condition, but chances are you won't do as well in terms of your outcomes uh, if you totally avoid, um, you know, what we think um, is going to work. So, you know, uh, I, I find like the new obesity drugs fascinating. I don't prescribe a lot of that, but, you know, those are really taking over the GLP-1 analogs and um, they're helping a lot of people lose weight and keep weight off and control their diabetes a lot better. And they're extremely expensive and they're kind of blowing up the budgets of everybody's kind of like pharmacy benefit package. Um, so should we pay for them? Should this many people be getting on Ozempic and Wagovi and, and the like? Um, if I were overweight and struggling with diabetes, like I would want to be on them, um, but it's not going to be for everyone. But that's, you know, that's an opportunity. That's a new form of medication we didn't really have. Their branded products are incredibly expensive. They're making these companies trillions of dollars, probably when it's all said and done. Um, but they might like really be improving the overall kind of population's health. And they might have done it through kind of a scientific discovery approach that seems to be working. So that's mm -hmm. that's I kind of let's have that debate. Like, should anybody go on Ozembic? Because you can't just say, oh, you got to do everything else to lose weight, because generally people can't find a way to lose weight um, once they have a serious kind of weight problem. It's just really hard and we don't have like great solutions. And this one all of a sudden seems like a like a big winner. Mm -hmm. I'm all for prevention rather than cure. I'm sure that you would probably be that way inclined as well. Doctor. Yeah, Lee. it's nice, except that most people over the age of 50 are overweight. So like the you, mm. you don't that opportunity for prevention is gone when you're seeing someone that already has the problem, right? Like I totally agree with prevention, but let's talk about people that are currently, you know, with chronic diseases linked to overweight. And then what are we going to do, you know, for that person? Mm. Well, Dr. Lee, I could talk to you for another hour or so. I'd love to ask you more questions, but we're out of time. So I want to just thank you very much for making the time and for answering uh, my questions. Thank you for what you do. I know that you're very passionate about helping people uh, get over alcohol and opiate use disorders. And I know you've done a lot of clinical trials and treated many patients struggling with addiction. So thank you for that. And I acknowledge you for that. Where can our listener uh, find more about you and your work online if they so desire? Yeah, the Orhel story, which is kind of now trucks one for alcohol through an app, and that's the the company um, where I'm a science advisor. That's Or Health, O A R Health dot com, and then my own faculty page. Just Google Joshua Lee, NYU School of Medicine, and you'll find all my stuff uh, on our school's website. Amazing, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thanks so much for having me.